Oh, what do we have here? A package from Bissell Vacuum. Well, let's see what I got sent. It's two brand new vacuum gauges, an Inficon PSG 500. It is a Pirani probe that can measure pressures from atmospheric to 5 times 10 to the power of minus 4 millibars. And an Inficon BPG 402S. This vacuum gauge can measure pressures from atmospheric to 5 times 10 to the power of minus 10 millibars. This means that I can measure pressures in the ultra high vacuum range. At this point, I would like to thank from the bottom of my heart the managing director of Vissel Vacuum. This is a German company that specializes in the manufacturing and the sale of vacuum components. The managing director contacted me and donated this equipment to me. It is through people like him that I am able to pursue my hobby. If you watched this video, thank you very, very much. Now I just need to get the vacuum gauges to tell me the pressure. I have considered using enhanced interrogation techniques, but it is well known that the pressures obtained this way are very unreliable, not to mention the moral implications. So looks like I have to buy a controller for the gauges. Oh, never mind. I will build a vacuum controller myself that can read three gauges at the same time. Thank goodness, these vacuum gauges are very easy to read and the manufacturer's data sheets are very detailed. The gauges output a voltage between 0 and 10 volts. This voltage is logarithmically related to the pressure and is easy to convert. All I need is a voltage divider to reduce this voltage to a maximum of 5 volts and an Arduino to read the voltage, convert it to a pressure and show it on a display. Because I am using three displays and an ADC to increase the precision of the voltage measurement, I am also using a multiplexer. This multiplexer enables me to use many IC squared devices with the same address. I 3D printed this board where I can mount all of the components to to make everything a little bit neater and cleaner in the housing. So the next step is to use some thread inserts and install them. Don't worry, I won't bore you with watching me installing 15 thread inserts. With the thread inserts installed, I was able to screw down the Arduino, the multiplexer, the analog digital converter and the three voltage dividers. I then soldered all of the connections. Right here you can see the three pull down resistors I am using at the pins which will detect whether or not the gauge is powered. I also included this bracket on my 3D printed part to hold five micro JST connectors. This will make it a lot easier to connect the front panel with the displays and the power buttons. I then spent a lot of time trying to get the software to work. I wanted the controller to be able to detect whether or not a gauge is connected and to detect whether or not that gauge has power. While losing my sanity trying to write the code, I decided to start printing the housing for the gauge. The largest printing I have ever attempted. So wish me luck. While this print was running, I decided to take some breaks from writing the code to proceed with building the controller itself. Which means I finally have an opportunity to use the acrylic scraps I bought on eBay years ago. And what a coincidence, it perfectly fits my cat design. I just have to shorten these boards a little bit. I always make sure to directly vacuum everything after using the saw because yes, this is my bed and I hate sleeping in metal or acrylic chips. I just have to drill the according holes into the acrylic. Should be an easy job. It was already late at this point and I was impatient. Being impatient works out every time for me. So I had to cut some more acrylic boards, but I used the opportunity to get this extremely sophisticated shot of the camera moving with the saw. And this one, it's like you are the vacuum. The second time I was more careful and everything worked, so here's some ASMR content for you. Warning, continuity error, I 3D printed this backplate which holds the sockets for the cables connecting the controller with the gauge and for the power cable. In my last design I used an external power supply, but it was in my opinion annoying. So this time I integrated the power supply into the controller. After installing some more thread inserts, I could screw down the socket for the power cable. For two of the three available inputs, I'm using six pin connectors, which are often called aviation connectors. But for the Infigon PSG500, I'm using an RJ45 connector, since that's the one the gauge uses. For the other gauges, I have to make custom cables anyway, that's why I'm using the aviation plugs. 
the 3D printed backplate has slots in which the acrylic boards will fit. They will create a two layer design with the power supply and the step down converter for the Arduino at the bottom. The top layer will contain all of the other electronics like the voltage divider, ADC, Arduino and multiplexer. This way I can just slide the whole assembly in and out of the housing. As a power supply I'm using a 24 volt 2.5 ampere LED power supply. This will be more than enough to power three gauges and the Arduino. I used cable crimps and T-shrink tubing to connect all of the mains power cables to the power supply. To supply the Arduino I need a step down converter. It is mounted directly next to the power supply. After everything was wired up I tested it, only to find out that the light in the switch is always on. The switch works but the light never turns off. So I disassembled everything, changed the connection at the switch and put it back together. Don't forget to adjust your voltage at the step down converter or you will probably fry your Arduino. Here you can see the front of the gauge. It has cutouts for the three OLED displays and three buttons to power the different gauges. Those are the buttons I'm going to use. They have blue indicator lights to show if they have been pressed or not. Is it necessary? No. Does it look cool? Definitely. I am using three 0.96 inch SSD 1306 OLED displays. They use the I squared C pins which makes it way easier to wire them up because one display only uses four wires in total. Man, I think I should make Hollywood movies with those high quality cuts. Okay, so after around 10 hours of printing, something happened that happens to probably every Ender 3 printer. The extruder broke, the small plastic piece here. Um, so yeah, I have to change it. Here you can see the culprit and it broke right here. I already glued it with some super glue and used some UVQ resin to strengthen it a little bit and I just used it for another test piece to see if everything fits but before printing the large housing again I will definitely replace it so yeah I don't risk um, the print failing after 10 hours again wasting a lot of filament and time. I ordered this aluminum extruder on Amazon and as far as I know they are pretty um, well received in the community and work quite good. While I'm fixing my 3D printer, I want to tell you about the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant. I learn best through hands-on application and interactive exercises. And that's exactly the concept Brilliant follows to teach you math, science and computer science. Everyone, no matter what their level of education is, has areas where they can improve their understanding of the world. For example, I may have an education in chemistry, but my knowledge of mechanics and computer science is very poor. When you try to learn a new field of knowledge on your own, you are quickly overwhelmed by the mass of information. This is where I use Brilliant to improve my knowledge in small portions, usually for 30 minutes a day. The exercises start simple to give everyone an easy start and get progressively harder. For every single task, there are intuitive explanations to understand the origin of possible mistakes. I use Brilliant's mobile app to use the time on the subway learning about computer science. This way I can use the half hour ride to the university to expand my knowledge about topics I would otherwise probably not have the energy for. To get started for free, you can use my link in the video description. Or go directly to brilliant.org slash advanced tinkering. Brilliant has agreed to give the first 200 people a 20% discount on the one year premium membership. And now back to the video. 
I was just checking if everything works and as you know I'm using the buttons in front here to switch on the power to my gauge the 24 volts and I'm switching ground in these switches here not the 24 volt line. Um, I'm doing that because I want the software to know if the gauge is powered or not. So I have um, three pins here on the Arduino. They have a pull-up resistor um, and this um, these three pins are connected by these um, thin red lines here to the ground line that gets switched. So if I press the button and ground is connected, the pins also get pulled down to ground and the Arduino knows that the gauge is powered. But I noticed something strange. If I measure the um, contacts on my connector for the gauge, I noticed that there is 18 volts between ground and my 24 volt line, even if the button is not depressed. And that shouldn't be the case. And what I think is happening is that um, somehow these pins that go through the, uh, these um, cables that go through the Arduino pins, somehow um, my voltage is flowing through there and going through the Arduino to ground. At least that's what I'm suspecting. I'm not Marco Reps, so <laughs> I'm, I don't know that much about electronics, but I will use some diodes and solder them in between these two to deviate the problem and that will solve this. Okay, I think I just fried my Arduino board because even if I just connect the 5 volt USB port, the chip gets so hot I can't keep my finger on it. So I'm thinking about replacing it with an Arduino Nano or buying a replacement board, but I don't want to um, sacrifice another, I think, $30 board before I know what caused this. So I think I will try it with the Arduino uh, Nano first. I thought a little bit about it and I have decided to use an Arduino Nano instead of the Mega 2560 Pro, I think. Because first of all, the Arduino Mega is not necessary. The Arduino Nano can handle this task well. And it brings down the cost of the project. The Arduino Mega 2560 Pro costs about $30 or 30 euros. And yes, you can get an Arduino Nano clone for yeah, three to five bucks. And I 3D printed this mounting here where I can push the Arduino Nano in. And it just stays there. And I can screw it down to one of these existing mounting holes. The only drawback is that I won't be able to use the USB port because the hole inside the housing doesn't line up. This uh, USB port is at another position, it's a little bit lower, but that's not that big of a deal because I don't plan on using this USB port anyway. And as you will see later in the video, when I show you the housing, you can access this Arduino very easily by just pulling out the back and you just have to do it to reprogram it if you get another gauge and yeah i will probably won't get another gauge in the near future so i think the adreno nano is a good choice okay so i realized that still something doesn't work the way i like to and it has nothing to do with diodes or anything like that the problem is that in the gauge the ground line is connected with also the ground line so the common line of the signal. So it doesn't matter what I do here. I simply cannot switch ground um, with these switches here because it doesn't matter if they're on or not. The 24 volts uh, will flow through the common ground that is also used for the signal. So I have to switch the 24 volt positive line at the front here. But that means I cannot detect, that's something I wanted to do, I cannot detect um, whether or not the button is pressed and the power is on because I cannot um, use the 24 volt line to pull up one of those pins here because the Arduino only takes 5 volts. I thought about doing a voltage divider but then I would have to do a voltage divider for each um, button. So yeah, um, yeah. I think I will rewire, uh, re rewire, Jesus Christ. I think I will 
change it uh, to yeah um, switch 24 volts in front here. I also got a new small soldering tip because using this one to solder the Arduino pins feels like in Germany there is a saying es fühlt sich an als würde man eine Gehirn OP mit einer Rohrzange durchführen wollen and it translates to trying to do a brain surgery with a um, pipe wrench so yeah that's why I got this new soldering tip after fixing that problem by rewiring everything and including a voltage divider for each button, I was still having a lot of troubles. I wanted to use the identification pin at the gauge to detect whether or not a gauge is connected. This identification pin is simply connected to ground with a certain resistor value. This way the controller knows the type of gauge that is connected. I was just using three of the digital pins on the Arduino to detect whether a gauge is connected or not. I could have made a voltage divider to measure the resistance and identify the gauge automatically. But that would not have been necessary since I won't change my gauges anytime soon and they will always be connected to the same plug. While trying to get this to work I encountered another problem. My second Arduino released its magic smoke. I was getting 24 volts on my identification pin and I had no idea why. I tried so many things and checked every connection twice. Every connection but one. After three fried Arduinos I was seriously losing my sanity and I was doubting myself. And I just couldn't figure out what was going on because looking at the diagram, I couldn't imagine any way that pin number one would be connected to the 24 volt supply. The pin number one is the sense line. And I don't know why, but I didn't think about that. But at some point I just thought maybe I should check the cable I soldered. And would you know what, if we connect the sense line and the 24 volt line, they are shorted. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, so yeah, I will just um, open the connector here up again and fix that and then everything should work. And I, I just ripped out everything I did before um, because I couldn't understand what I was doing wrong. Yeah, it looks like that was all for nothing. It was a shorted cable all the time. While resoldering the cable, my soldering iron started acting weird. Whenever I picked it up, it displayed an error message on the screen and the temperature readings were all over the place. I'm pretty sure it's a loose contact in the cable. Ersa, the manufacturer, offered me to send it back to them and they will fix it free of charge. But I wanted to finish this project, so I kept going with the soldering iron, I had to wiggle a few times to get it to heat up. Since the 24 volts not only fried my Arduino, it also fried my multiplexer, I had to buy a new one. And I'm going to install this one right now, and then everything should work. It is finally done, everything is wired correctly. While I was replacing the damaged uh, multiplexer, I also replaced the analog digital converter. It worked, but I want to make sure that there is a device in there that doesn't wasn't exposed to the 24 volts, so I won't get any false readings. And I also checked the voltage dividers back here to make sure that the resistance is still um, okay. So how um, does everything work now? The first function I wanted to have is that the controller detects if a gauge is connected or not and displays it on the displays on the front. So these gauges have an internal resistor and this resistor is connected to a special pin on the gauge. It's the identification pin. And I guess the original controller checks the resistance and has a chart of known resistance values that corresponds to a certain gauge. So I thought about doing that. It wouldn't be that hard. I just needed some voltage dividers um, to calculate the resistance of my gauge. But I just thought it isn't worth it because I don't have that many gauges and I can just label the inputs in the back here to know which um, input corresponds to which gauge. It's not like I'm planning on selling this and if you wanted to do this it would be really easy. You just need to measure the resistance of this pin. In my case I'm only measuring if this pin is connected to ground or not. So I'm using 
um, the, the digital pins on my Arduino. They are connected to 5 volts by a pull-up resistor. So I have a certain state of that pin. And whenever a gauge is connected, um, the pin will, pull, will get pulled to ground and the Arduino will display that a gauge has been connected. One thing is that I needed to use 100k um, resistors because the resistance in the gauges can go up to, I think, 50k. So I needed to make sure that the resistance of my pull-up resistor is higher than resistance in the gauge. Otherwise, it wouldn't um, uh, see that there is a gauge connected. The second functionality I wanted is that the controller knows when I'm pressing a button to power the gauge. And that is done by three additional digital pins. And I'm switching um, 24 volts now with the switches on the front. And I can't detect 24 volts with my Arduino, otherwise I would fry it again. So what I did is I got some voltage dividers, I just soldered some um, resistors together and they are all contained in these heat shrinks here. There are the pull-up resistors are also in this heat shrink here, um, just to tuck them away and uh, don't get any shorts. And I have a voltage divider in here which divides the voltage by 5 and then I can use my Arduino to detect these 5 volts if the button in the front is pressed. And I also am using pull down resistors in this case. In this case, they are just 10K resistors um, to pull the pin to ground to have a fixed state. So now that everything is explained, let's put it in the case. I printed the housing with a 2.4 millimeter wall thickness and I'm always impressed how solid those prints feel. I have a confession to make. I started building this controller before I even had the vacuum gauges. And when I started building it, I thought I would get a Pfeiffer IKR251 for the high vacuum measurements. Just as I was putting the case together, I was told that I'm getting an Infigon BPG402. Since this gauge uses an ionization gauge for the high vacuum measurements, I need an additional function, the so-called degassing. Degassing is used to expel adsorbed molecules on the surface of the anode. So I reprinted the front of the housing and added an additional push button. With this push button I can start the degas process. It takes 3 minutes and the display will show me that the gauge is currently in degas mode. But then, finally, it was done and I could put all of the components together. To test the gauges, I've connected them in this test setup. As you can see, here is the Infigon PSG500. Here you can see the Bayer Alpert and Priani combination gauge. And I have also connected my ionization gauge, my old one right here, because I'm interested to see how the values compare to my other high vacuum gauge on top here. And I have my old and trusty Pfeiffer vacuum gauge connected at my four line pump to see what the roughing pressure is. When I turn the vacuum gauge controller on, as you can see, he's telling me that all gauges are connected but not powered. And a weird thing I noticed with the Infigon PSG500 is that if I turn the power on, the pressure seems a little bit high, but it's you know in the ballpark. But then after a few seconds, it drops dramatically right now and it stabilizes at around 4.35 times 10 to the power of 2 millibar at ambient pressure. And that's not correct. I'm not sure why the gauge does that. It's not my controller. I tested it on all three channels and I also uh, read the voltage from the gauge manually and it also drops. 
as I said, I don't know what it is, but as soon as I lower the pressure with my vacuum pump, the gauges agree in their margin of error. So it seems like this gauge is not suitable, even though it should be suitable for ambient pressures. As you can see, the lower two gauges basically agree. I am now going to turn on the roughing pump to lower the pressure. As you can see, all the gauges agree um, in a certain margin of error. The bottom gauge shows a lower pressure, which makes sense because it's the gauge that is nearest to the vacuum pump. It's my four line pressure gauge and it's directly on top of the pump. This one is the high vacuum gauge and this one is the other Pirani gauge, which is, which is also connected to my high vacuum. And I will now turn on the turbo molecular pump and this one will probably shut down after a while because it's not made for those pressures. And after that I will turn on my ionization gauge down here and then we can compare those two pressures. After turning on the turbo molecular pump we should see the pressure at my four line pump rise. I have now started the turbo molecular pump and as you can see the pressure here rises and my other gauges show that the pressure is dropping. I will now turn on my other gauge. I think I will turn off the Pirani gauge connected to the high vacuum because it's not of any use anyways. The high vacuum gauge here has now switched over to the um, ionization mode. The turbo molecular pump is now up to speed and I'm pretty happy to see that those two gauges show a very similar pressure. Of course this is Tor and this is millibar but I will show the millibar value of this one at the screen when the pressure stabilizes. At this point those two gauges basically agree. 1.2 Tor are about I think 1.7 millibars so they are well within their, mar their margin of error and I'm pretty stoked that these two gauges show basically the same pressure. You may have noticed that there are some new parts on my Stern Gerlach experiment setup um, especially the stepper motor here this thing here and this thing here. I won't talk about it in this video, but I just want to let you know that I haven't forgotten this experiment and I'm still working on it. There are a lot of parts that have to be made and I will make another video about this thing here and the other thing here when the time comes and I have all of the parts to make a good video. I really want to thank the people that um, stayed with me and are also interested in this experiment. It's the largest experimental project I've ever undertaken. The controller basically is also a part of the Stengerlach experiment. It will be placed um, hopefully somewhere here if it fits. Otherwise it will stay on the side. And yeah, I am so excited to see everything um, coming together. For a future video I hope to be able to get hold of an original Inficon vacuum controller. This way I could compare the results of my homemade version with the professional device. I again want to thank Whistle Vacuum for their generosity. And I want to thank my patrons for supporting me in a time where I am not able to upload as many videos as they were used to. Thank you a lot for watching.